Hey, so Phil, would, would you mind starting off, Phil, talking a bit about um, your track for the album? But And also, you know, you touched on the kind of folk scene and how the Dobro's been accepted into the folk scene, because I think that's quite interesting. I'm discovering the bluegrass scene, which uh, Bruno knows, well, I expect you all know quite a lot about that. And um, But that is different from the folk scene. And maybe you could talk a bit about that, Phil. Yeah, the two, the two scenes are quite separate. Um, I mean, the folk scene is a bit bigger and more established here than the bluegrass scene is. Um, to be honest, I've had very little to do with the bluegrass scene over the years. I make my living on the folk circuit. And to be honest, I'm, I'm not really a bluegrass player. Um, that's not really where I come from musically. But yeah, the, the, you get some crossover, you get some some acts like the Karavik Sisters that are very much um, the kind of old time and bluegrass act that are accepted on the folk scene because they kind of they've come through the grassroots of the folk scene, even though their heart really lies somewhere else, if you know what I mean? Yeah, um, they've managed to make it work on the folk circuit. Um, where, where I stand with it is I'm, I'm just I consider myself a musician that works in the folk genre. I'm not a folky. I'm not a bluegrasser. I'm not a, an old time American musicer. I'm just a musician that likes all different types of music and fell in love with the sound of the dobro. Um, and I, I consider it my first instrument, um, even though it's not the first instrument I picked up. It's I consider it the one that I'm the best best on out of the other instruments that I play. So if people, you know, if that's my go to instrument. If people ask me to, to come and do something, I say, do you want the dubra on it? You know, um, and um, yeah, making it work on the folk scenes is interesting because uh, like you guys have, have discussed, people often don't know what it is and they say, why are you holding your guitar upside down? Or are you trying to sell ice creams and all this kind of bollocks that they come out with? Um, but what I've, what I've tended to do is kind of explain it a little bit during the set because there's something about the folk circuit here that's in, that the people like the, to have the songs explained in quite a lot of detail and they like patter in between the songs. That's quite an important part of the show. So yeah. I make a point of explaining the instrument and, you know, making light of, you know, how they might be a bit confused by it and what have you. Um, and it, it seems to work quite well. Um, I play in a duo mostly with my wife um, and she's a, a great songwriter and I often use the Dobro to accompany her songs and and add and add to that um though i do obviously i do solo material as well which is where the track comes from it comes from a solo album i made a few years ago called true north um and i made that album to commemorate 10 years since i traveled to india to study with uh Debashish Bhattacharya. um that's where i picked up the, the chaturangi there mm, lovely uh, <laughs> yeah so um that's a big influence on me is the sound of Indian music and the technique of Indian slide players, which is really kind of off the scale in terms of accurate intonation. Um, so that's what took me over there. It wasn't, I didn't want to become an Indian musician. I didn't want to, you know, live in an ashram and, um, and go down that route. But I, I kind of wanted to learn from those great players who can just play so in tune all the way up right to the to the bridge you know without really without I'm thinking about it, without looking at it so I wanted to to get involved with that so yeah 10 years since I traveled to Calcutta to study with the great Pandit Debashish Bhattacharya I made the album True North and the track that I chose from that is one called uh, Domino Road so the kind of the, the overarching theme of the album was uh, 10 years of traveling with slide guitars um, and that particular track, Domino Road, is um, a, a track that I wrote in Australia when I first went there to tour. Um, it's very, uh, very green to the whole uh, Australian thing. And we went to stay with some lovely people in uh, like an area just outside Victoria, a very rural spot. And the lovely guy that I was staying with, um, 
said uh, well i said to him very green i said i've not seen any kangaroos yet and he said i'll help you out mate jump in the ute this is two o'clock in the morning after we've been drinking and what have you I said jump in the ute i'll take you up domino road you'll see kangaroos wombats wallabies the whole shebang no problem so uh, i was like yeah let's do it I jumped in the ute we're driving up and down this it's kind of like dirt track through trees and what have you, you didn't see a bloody thing all evening <laughs> um and then I spent the rest of that tour trying to avoid the things jumping through the windscreen at every possible <laughs> opportunity. So it's like, it was a kind of a funny, um, you know, um, uh, so I just, it stuck in my head that particular place. So I, I wrote yeah. a tune named after Domino Road. Um, and the, the, yeah, so the piece is in um, drop E tuning. So it's the G tuning, the standard G tuning with the bottom string down to E. And I'm quite obsessed with modes. I tend to write a lot in the Lydian mode. So that's your G major with a sharp four. Um, and so the so the first part of the piece starts in that mode, and it sits lovely with the open E string on the bottom, because it kind of puts it into kind of an E minor Dorian mode if you kind of start rooting that with an E underneath. So you get some lovely kind of flavors there from the modal side and then um so yeah kind of started off slow and then then i picked it up with a kind of tune it's a kind of trying to kind of get a kind of fiddle tune type vibe going and then it shifts back from the lydian mode into the kind of more g major uh familiar position and then you get some fast stuff going and um so just trying to conjure up that image of um you know driving through the australian bush <laughs> yeah looking for kangaroos and then trying to avoid them but yeah i mean it's definitely paid off isn't it in spades you know getting that um tuition early on and i've spent a lot of time working on intonation um playing up and down that top string really um just to just to have the confidence to go up there and not not have to worry you know and not have that tension come into your hat into your wrist as you go higher up um, yeah. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not perfect, but it's nice to have that freedom to, to break out and go higher up the instrument. Um, I don't play, I, I don't really play in a traditional bluegrass way and I don't play across the strings that much and, and in the kind of closed way, um, not, particularly not solo. I like to kind of have the open strings ringing out yeah. and kind of go melodic on the top string. Um, so yeah it's uh yeah it was a good a good foundation for me in terms of my intonation maybe i sound a bit more indian than i should at certain times which is probably why i don't get that many sessions you know it's like well we don't want indian music on this one we want it to sound like bluegrass you know it's like fair enough <laughs> yeah I can't, really get, I can't really get rid of it now it's written into the way that my hand moves so it's um it is what it is but yeah, it's beautiful. It's, <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's getting the sessions. Anyway, I mean, I, I think if you play pedal steel guitar, you get quite a lot of session work. Well, funnily enough, I've just I've just put a couple of benders on that lap steel there, thinking <laughs> to get some, um, you know, get some pedal yeah. steel work going without having to yeah. buy a pedal steel. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about buying one, uh, but they're not cheap, are they? And um, yeah, I've got it's hard to find the right one. Have you got one there, have you? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I've probably played pedal steel longer than I've played Dobro. Ah. Okay. You get all the session work down. I don't really. I, it's it's one of them things. If if you're not constantly on it, I don't know if you how you find, but if, if you're not in a band with it, and you kind of got no reason to play it, I won't play it. So I can go for like eighteen months without even without even taking it. It's here that I. I'll go for 18 months without even taking this cover off it. So yeah, um, it, it's one of them things. I play the Dobro in a little trio, so I'm I'm playing it regular, which is why I think you you kind of find your way around it a bit better, kind of become a bit more accustomed, a bit more familiar with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should think it will take quite a long time to get familiar with the pedal steel. I did have one before we started a family. And that was a student model. And even the student models cost about a grand back then. And uh, 
but then we started a family and moved house and all those things so I had to sell it <laughs> so but yeah maybe one day but um Darren why don't you talk a bit about your track and your background then some yeah, more yeah okay so um I really I've always had a Dobro I've had one since a long time maybe maybe 15 years I've, I've had a Dobro 15 20 years and I didn't really do anything with it other than just noodle about like I do with a, a lot of instruments played guitar a long time I can't remember not playing guitar but with the Dobro it was kind of something that I took up big time in lockdown in kind of COVID-19 um, and it was strange how it came about it was just like um, two of my mates close mates are, are really good musicians played in a band with them for a long time Ben plays upright bass um, Guy is like like God on the bluegrass scene in the UK um, he, he's in all kinds of different lineups and, and festivals and stuff and they uh, there was a time when it was kind of illegal to go around someone's house. You remember that when it was like, it it was kind of like you couldn't leave the house. And if you did, it was, it was illegal to even meet up with someone outside. Um, yeah. And anyway, we were having a Zoom session like this with, with, with these two guys. And uh, and anyway, they Ben, the bass player, said, hey, Darren, I don't know if you know, but me and Guy, we've been uh, just meeting up around his house playing some tunes so I, right. I thought, well all right well Jesus I'll bring I'll bring the Dobro around so it kind of went from that we felt like uh, it was exciting it kind of felt like we were outlaws like playing <laughs> this music playing bluegrass music it was um but yeah I just love it and and it, it's interesting actually hearing hearing Phil kind of talk about different modes and stuff like that and I, I think I got to a point on a guitar where I was thinking too much about that kind of stuff Coming to the Dobro and then just playing it, I just like the sound of it. If there's a sound that I want it to make, I just sit with it until it makes the sound. I'm not too, I'm not too concerned about what scale I'm using or, or um, I don't don't get too involved with it. I just kind of, kind of have that feeling about when I was playing guitar for the first time. You know, when when you're playing guitar when you're a kid and you kind of just want to, you just want to pick it up. Um, so the song that, that I submitted is from our little trio called Sense Valley. The song's called Give Me Some Reasons. Uh, and it was just that. I, I was just stuck of something to play on it. There's not always a lot of songs that you can find on a dog bro that uh, are playing. Often you'll go down a bit of a wormhole listening to kind of Rob Ike's records or, you know, Jerry Douglas and people like that trying to find something that you could easily pick out by ear. Um, so I end up just kind of writing little pieces on it. Um, and that was just just one that I came up with that I just just took to the to the guys and and we made it into a song. So yeah, I like it. It's, I love the lyric. And is it sort of based on your personal experience, or is it imagining somebody's situation? Yeah, not really. I, I kind of I kind of just write whatever I feel like. You know, I think I, I don't always think songs have to come from a personal. I, no. I think anything you anything you write will resonate with someone. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. Do you guys play and sing as well? I don't know. I don't know how usually it is that people play the dobro and sing. You don't see that very often, I don't think. But I've tried for many years and can't really do it. Whenever we come, whenever I, my bands do a number where I'm singing, I play guitar. Yeah. I, I just can't do it. I do do it, but it, it is a, it is a challenge because you've got you 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 basically your voice is fretless and the dobro is fretless so you you're pitching two things at once and it can <laughs> be a real bender at times <laughs> yeah um, but i do do it and um yeah slightly reluctantly so hats off to people that can play dobro and sing at the same time i'm <laughs> impressed um absolutely yeah martin harley's good at it isn't he and um <laughs> He's extremely good at it, yeah um do you know in America, Abby Abby Gardner? Oh yeah, she's done a whole album of it, hasn't she? Just yeah, she, she's the very good. Yeah. Very, uh, yeah, she does it. You know, she does it all the time. So mm. it's like anything, isn't it? I suppose. But um, yeah, but, well, yeah, I mean, she also plays a lot solo dobro, and like really, the arrangement for the dobro really need to be worked out with, with the vocals. And she mm. spends a lot of time doing that. She was teaching at Rocky Grass last year, and. You know, from all the different workshops that I've, I've been to, like her approach to the dobro is really one of a of a singer songwriter who is, thinks completely differently about the instrument than probably all of us and most most 
of the Dobro players, where you know the um, where your your focus is not uh, coming from like you know oh here's here's the vocal and now I need to f- fit the Dobro around it mm-hmm. as a solo as a solo um, singer songwriter. Who are you talking about, Bruno? Oh, it's Abby Gardner. I don't know her. I'll look yeah, her so, up. yeah. So David, tell us a little bit about your your background and your your track on the album and okay. Except so, um, I'm Scottish, I've always been Scottish, but I, I walked into a bar, a Scotsman walked into a bar, um, who'd have thunk it, about, I don't know, it must be about 26 years ago now, and I heard somebody playing a dobro, and I'd never heard one before, and I'd never seen one before, and I just fell in love with it, and I thought, well, I'm going down that road. So I tried to make one out of an ordinary guitar, and uh, eventually spoke to somebody that knew what they were talking about and pointed me in the right direction. So that was, I think I got my first proper dobro about 25 years ago. And uh, and then it, I discovered Sore Fingers and went to that. And I think the, the first one I went to of that was in either 2000 or 1999, something like that. Right. Um, it was Stacey Phillips. Oh, wow. Sadly passed away, just was it last year, I think? Recently, crazy, yeah. crazy dobro player Stacey Phillips. If you've got look out for his, some of his recordings, he does like Chopin stuff, and, and you know, it's it's nuts. He does four string slants and things that are impossible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds a bit like it as well sometimes, to be honest, but uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's really interesting, anyway. So, um, played dobro, played in a bluegrass band for quite a few years called Appalachian Mist, which is all kind of Scottish guys. Played in Ireland, played in England, and then that all stopped. And I met a harpist at Celtic Connections about must be 15 years ago now. And she was studying at a college, at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music here in Glasgow, doing Celtic harp. But she was actually um, from Alaska. And um, she was living here, and we just started playing together, and we're still playing together. Uh, it's been good. So our track is um, from an album which is kind of old now. It's time we did another one. Um, so we start off with um, Clinch Mountain Backstep. And then that melds into Shove the Pig's Foot a little further into the fire and then back to um, Clinch and then back again. She comes from the, the Scottish trad music scene, so they're not allowed to play just one tune. They always have to play two or three and nail them together. I don't know why. <laughs> you have to play them in sets. You know? Or if you play that one, then you have to play that one with it. They do the same in Ireland, sure, John. Yeah, eh? All the time. <laughs> three. You, you put three together. That is, it's it's, well, it's uh, backward as the police arrive, if you don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> you away in the party wagon. You know. <laughs> anyway, so she's she was up for playing dobro stuff on on the harp, so I uh, playing bluegrass stuff on the harp rather. So um, got her to play Clinch Mountain Backstep. I think that might be a first. I don't know if any other harpist is playing Clinch Mountain Backstep. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I'm really pleased for her. <laughs> so that that's that, and uh, we're still playing. They've got she's got family now. She's got married and got family, so we're not playing as much. But um, I'm not looking to be running around all over the world. Or even just Britain too much these days. So um, just playing over the summertime really is, is fine for me. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. I've never heard anything like it with that harp, really. Um, <laughs> it really works well, you know. It's... The dobro and the harp do go really nicely together as two instruments because the, the harp hasn't got much sustain. It's got, I mean, it's got a bit of sustain, but the, the dobro can really carry that. But the harp's got such a huge range of notes. Uh, sorry, it can play bass David, for you. Does she have pedals melody. on the harp? Sorry, I apologize. Sorry, John, go. Does she have pedals on the harp? No, she's got levers. Levers, yeah. Okay. It's a lever harp. So, yeah, no, not a pedal harp. I think pedal harps are really the orchestral music kind of goes down the pedal harp route. I think all... Oh, Traditional musicians either play just straightforward harps or lever harps with the uh, toggles on the top. You know, it's amazing watching her doing it, man. She's because <laughs> of course every time she changes to a different chord, well, most times she has to 
reset a couple of the strings and uh, it's um yeah it's it's a thing to watch it's a bit like playing pedal steel there's a lot going on <laughs> but yeah no i think the two instruments work really nicely together and uh yeah yeah, they do. Absolutely. Uh, have you seen in uh, uh, in Ireland at all, John, anybody doing a similar thing? No, no, I have not. Uh, yeah. So it goes back to the question again that that uh, the, the, the traditional music in Ireland is 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 a religion. It's, it's very <laughs> it's very regimented, and they don't they, you 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 don't improvise. No. At all. Like you, you can embellish notes, you can you can play triplets and you can do certain things, but you can't go off on a tangent and start bringing in pentatonic scales and, you know, trying to push the boundary of it. You can't. It's, right. It's seriously frowned upon. You've got to stick to the dots if you're playing trad stuff with trad. You do. And we kind of straddle both camps somehow. We, I mean, we've played it, we've played it, did Martin? And I mean, not all the stuff we do is bluegrass by any manner of means. It's about 50 50. And we've played it at, at folk festivals. So we seem to be able to play in, in both camps. Yes. Not that we're making much of a noise in either, to be honest. But anyway, we're, we're certainly accepted, no problem. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very. Uh, I put up a few tunes and uh, they've been accepted because I didn't mess with them. <laughs> I did. I did a, a drowsy Maggie and and uh, the wind that shakes the barley and a few other standards and so on. But I didn't, you know, I didn't interfere with them. I play them as they should be, if you like. Although the temptation was always there to try and, you know, put something in there, but you you just you can't do it. You'd be, you'd be actually assassinated. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's is that is it's that serious. unique to Ireland then? John, is it that... is because the tradition of the music is is goes back so so far. Yeah, that they take it very 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 serious. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I, like there are times when when you could play at sessions and just have a bit of crack, you know, have the fun. But if you go to something that's like the Chieftains or someone like that, that they, you know, you don't you don't mess with it. You play it as, and there are millions of tunes. Yeah. Like gazillions of them, you know. I know. Yeah, it's great. It's great to listen to. You know, it's a wonderful talent. Absolutely, uh, but yeah. Uh, it, so in England, Phil, have you, you've not found that quite the same with the folk approach? Then, oh, you will. You will meet. You'll meet a lot of musicians that think like that on the English folk scene as well, and they tend to be the ones that play the dance music. Uh, a lot of the tunes come from the Morris dancing tradition and what have you. Um, and yeah, you you not to mess with them. I've been told off for messing with them before. Okay. Um, but there is also there's quite a strong tradition in the English folk scene of of, of innovation and 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 messing with it as well. It kind of the the two go hand in hand really. Um, the, the young musicians coming through tend to want to do something new with with the tradition, respecting the traditional stuff respecting where it comes from but they want to take it somewhere new mostly some of them want to recreate what's already been done but um yeah there's there's a tradition to tr to try and take it somewhere new as well but you will meet the folk police um in sessions and if you take a dobro into an english folk session you're not going to be welcome really um what when you're surrounded by uh, squeeze boxes there's not much point anyway you might as well just have a pint and stand at the bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's there. interesting. <laughs> um, Bruno, tell us something about, uh, well, your track features um, Lewis, doesn't it, as well? That's right, yeah. So, I mean, this is um, uh, my friend Lewis Cohen, who's... Uh, uh, you know, been on the bluegrass scene for some years. He's originally more of, of a blues singer, and then um, uh, played with a with a, a band called the Wagon Tales in London, and uh, in, the, in the bluegrass scene with Ben Summers on bass, and and uh, and then uh, you know a lot with Leanne Thoreau's, and 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 I that's how that's where I got to know him, and um, um, and uh, but he also he's a, he has a day job, he has a family, and so on. He didn't want to 
be playing so much. And then, you know, we started a duo um, thing where we could we would say, well, we, we both have day jobs. We don't want to be that busy with bands and all that. You know, we can play a handful of gigs over the, you know, over the summer festivals. And we got a little set list together. Um, that was probably around maybe 2017. And, and we played a few festivals 20, 2018, but then, uh, but then we had a daughter and then they had another kid and we played less and then we and then COVID came and so on. And we've never really gotten around to recording anything properly. But um, at some point when uh, when he visited me here in this in this room a few years ago, I recorded like three or four tracks that we thought maybe we could put together as an EPs. And, uh, you know, at the time where we we didn't know about that COVID was coming and all that. So um so I had a bunch of these unfinished recordings sitting here, and one of them was this this um, uh, wonderful track called "Come Down Jehovah" that um, uh, we had we had played live together, and um, it it was just a sort of a single take of of Lewis vocals and guitar just recorded at the same time, and I'd never done anything with it, and then I asked Lewis, "Are you?" happy for me to to you know use that you know use that for the Dobro compilation album um and and he was so I just recorded a, some some Dobro on it and uh, sent it on to Chris and um so I mean I love I love the Dobro and I love playing and I've been to a lot of these um uh you know workshops I've been to Rocky Grass um I don't know seven or eight times and and I've been to Sore Fingers almost every year and uh you, you you pick up a lot of stuff and you play in the sessions and um most of most of the stuff in the sessions is in is in G and once you know like you know three licks then um you can you can uh, awesome. you know at least make sure you don't hit a wrong note and then that's uh, that's been my goal ever since like to you know just not not sound completely out of place with everyone else and then um yeah, so that and but it was interesting also for me, like when I was playing with Lewis and then just playing in this duo setting and then also playing some of this these slower numbers. That's something that I hadn't really done much because you know a lot of the stuff that we played with the bluegrass bands and you know Johnny, you, you know, you know how Richie's driving the sound and then yeah. Paddy Paddy Kiernan is an absolute bit. unreal banjo player and it's you know we we were really going for it with that with that band so. Playing slow stuff and playing in tune and and you know finding nice melodies around that um, was a nice nice challenge for me for that um, for that slow song also with the um, sort of a nice sort of tongue in cheek lyrics that um, uh, I, you know resonate a lot with me uh, as a you know lifelong atheist. <laughs> yeah, it's a great song and I I heard it first uh, on Chris Wood's album you know a few years back and. My wife loves it. Um, you know, she, yeah, she, like you, she's not, uh, she's not a religious person and so she likes it. Um, I, my dad's a vicar, so I grew <laughs> up with the Church of England. But, um, I, but having said that, I'm not really religious either. So, and Chris Wood is just uh, the dog's bollocks, isn't he, basically, as a songwriter. <laughs> um, so that one he did about the, um, What's that one he did about the fish and chip shop? That one, man, that just brings a tear to my eye every time I hear it. What in a million that was, wasn't it? One in a million, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great, Bruno. Um, thank you. Uh, Johnny, tell us a bit about your background on the Dobro and your track. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for asking me to be part of this. You're welcome. I, I thought I was, uh, you know, on my own for so long. Uh, you know, it's nice. This is more of a ring, though, is it, as opposed to a club? I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do I, feel I, probably a bit on our own, don't we, as Dobro players? I, uh, I love, I I love the Dobro. I love it. It's like heroin. It's, it's extraordinarily addictive. I, I started maybe nine, ten years ago. I was playing guitar for years. Like I, I work as well, you know. So, uh, I I uh, never really thought I'd ever become a dobro player, and uh, I, I I bought a cheap dobro and didn't even know how to tune it. So I went up and Troy Brenningmeyer was very helpful. I didn't oh, even yeah. have a bar. I didn't even have a bar. I had like a steel guitar bar, just the wrong one. And uh, I just, it just, for some very strange reason, it, it just seemed to make sense. 
and uh, within a couple of hours I was kind of making noise that wasn't too terrible and since then I've been just on a dobro journey if you like I tried to do uh, I put up stuff on, on Facebook quite a bit but I, I tried to do to introduce the instrument to people so that they can hear what's going on but I also tried to to, to play different genres of music so the track that I did was just was the Johnny Mitchell thing both sides no and that's just the, the sheer heart like on its own you know, there's, there's this little bit of reverb but it's a, it's a guitar I picked up we went over to the IBMA with Neil Toner's band selling songs and they were selling selling Dobros at the trade show so I picked up that one and Bobby uh Bobby Wright was there. You know, you've probably heard of him, have you? He's, he's yeah. Had some yeah. So he set it up for me, and uh, I brought it home. And I've, been, I've been very pleased. So I used that for the track because the tone is is particularly sweet of it. And then last October, then I was over. I went to visit Paul Beard, and uh, <laughs> I bought a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Never uh, like I was going you. to buy one. I was going to buy one anyway. So uh, he's lovely. He's a lovely man. He's just so nice, and uh, he was very kind to me. And he had a he had a whole list. He had a whole load of Dobros uh, on the wall. And I saw when I saw the the the, uh, the bell. If you're familiar with it. I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah. See that yeah, those things are yeah. just monsters, aren't they? It's got two two cones. This cone here is a cone, uh, just you know, in front of it there, like a coal pilot. And it's uh, it's just a wonderful guitar. So really, that's my story. Is just I I love playing the dobro, and I just try to be as expressive as I can, and try to, not just to play bluegrass, although it's great, uh, but to to play Irish music and to play anything that would catch my ear. And just struggle with it till I got some kind of a measure on it. I feel like or the 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 whole thing about me is I just like I said before I love the sound of it, and I love the the, the response you get from people who hear it for the first time. Or, you know, it's, it's extraordinary, it's an extraordinary instrument. It's, it's, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. I'll, it's coming up to nine o'clock. I'll say a little bit about my track, shall I? And then um, I don't know if you've got any questions about the album or not, but um, what can I say? I, I was listening to all your tracks coming in and I, and I initially thought I'd do, um, and I did record this, so that song, that gospel song, I Wish I Knew How It Feels To Be Free, which is Nina Simone, you know. And I did a, a version of that, a uh, kind of ambient version, uh, and it's soulful, you know, and but quite fairly slow. <laughs> and I was listening to the tracks coming in, and I thought, oh, there's a lot of slow tracks. So I think I better do a faster track. So uh, towards the end of the process, I thought, well, it needs a bit of sort of traditional bluegrass, because I was surprised there wasn't a lot of traditional bluegrass. And I was also surprised there wasn't any blues really it's not really any minor pentatonic particularly on there but anyway i thought it probably needed something a bit more traditional so i did those two traditional tunes as best i could um thinking about the album as a whole and thinking about what punters might expect you know which is a dangerous thing really but so that was my contribution and um and my background is I think my background is just about slide guitar, really. I've just been obsessed with slide guitar since I was a teenager, starting out with bottleneck and doing a lot of that for a long time um, and getting into a more electric bottleneck, really, than acoustic. Um, and then as I've got older, I've got more into acoustic music and uh, I'd figured out that really the best way to get good slide guitar tone acoustically is a dobro or at least a lap steel acoustic you know so i i switched i tried to switch and i'm 
you know, very early on, Phil was kind enough to give me a lesson. And um, it, it's very difficult to switch from bottleneck to, to lap steel. I found it, you know, I couldn't play in tune. I was like, shit, I can't play in tune, you know. Uh, so it continues to be a struggle. But uh, like you've all said, like Johnny was just saying, it's addictive, isn't it? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a drug. And um, trying to get, you know, getting obsessed with tone and get going through different models and the cheaper ones and the more expensive ones and, and trying to get that tone. And it's an ongoing quest for me, really. Um, I probably shouldn't buy any more Dobros for a while. But um, yeah, so... And this idea was with the album was inspired from going to Nashville and then wanting to find like minded people in this country. And I knew some of you already, but some of you I've never met before. And but, uh, you know, your reputation precedes you, I suppose, some of you. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been great fun putting it together and I hope it's going to be well received. Um,